It's great to have uh, Ben O'Neill here with me today. Um, ben is a lecturer at the University of New South Wales at ADFA in Canberra, and he's written for Mises.org. He's written for a lot of places. He's a well-known libertarian, and uh, we just wanted to ask him a few questions about his background and what he's up to these days. So, Ben, good to have you here. Thanks very much for having me. So, just tell us uh, like a little bit about yourself. Like, um, how did you get into this libertarian thing? I suppose uh, the, the the first kind of real influence um, of libertarianism was having read Ayn Rand, um, uh, some of her novels and non-fiction work um, in my early 20s. Uh, prior to that, I, I think I was probably a kind of a classical liberal guy and um, implicitly in favour of small government but didn't really know much about the philosophy of liberalism and things like that until I uh, ran across Rand's work and then later on across the work of Mises and Rothbard and uh, those kind of Austrian economists. What do you think about uh, Rand? Um, like, Do you feel like she's a good introduction for people or would you recommend Rothbard to someone? Uh, it depends what you're looking for. I, I think in philosophy she's a very good introduction for someone and, and I think a uh, very good you know, influence overall. Um, Rand writes more on philosophy generally than uh, economics in particular. So if you're looking for uh, specifically economic analysis of kind of liberalism versus socialism, then I suppose in that case Mises and Rothbard will give you more detail. But I think Rand is very good for an overview of uh, moral and political philosophy and other aspects of philosophy that kind of form the foundation of that view. Yeah, it's interesting how everyone comes to libertarianism through different ways. Uh, my dad is a big Milton Friedman supporter, and so I started out by reading Milton Friedman, and then I, from there I heard about Ron Paul in 2007, and then from there I was tuned into the Austrian school, and that's pretty much where I'm at now. So, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like um, once you read Rothbard, you can't really go back. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, I think I was uh, like that with probably Rand and Rothbard. I think having read those two, it really feels like you've just been hit by a truck and um, I don't think you look at things the same way again. So I, I definitely had that same experience. Yeah, so which essays would you recommend by Rothbard? Um, I like his uh, essay on natural law in the ethics of liberty. That's uh, probably one of my favourites, um, and it also relates to the topic I'll be speaking about at the conference. Um, the introductory section to uh, For a New Liberty, where he sets out, I suppose, a bit about the kind of historical uh, story about how states come to... Uh, maintain their power over people. Um, I, th I think that's also very good. I mean, I could probably sit here all day and talk about good things Rothbard's written, but those are probably two that I found particularly um, interesting. Yeah, so what's it like uh, being an Austro-Libertarian at a university faculty? In um, look, for me, it's probably a bit of a non-event because I'm in the mathematics department, and so... Uh, a person's views on political and economic issues don't really factor into, I suppose, the environment here. Um, mm. I've heard from other libertarians who work in, you know, the politics faculties and, and things like this that they've had varied experiences. But for me, I think it's a little bit of a non-issue, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm currently doing my honours in politics and... For me, like the, the entire politics department is full of left-wing people, and I think it's more of an issue in those faculties, probably. And yeah. I mean, math is great. I mean, we Austrians always get criticized for not doing math. So, <laughs> um, well, I guess I'm the exception because I do a lot of math. But uh, I mean, it's probably the same here in the sense that I think uh, in a university environment, you know, it is very left-wing dominated. I, I couldn't really say for my particular faculty just because the issue doesn't really come up when you talk to people in the maths department. But, uh, yeah, I suppose in terms of my day-to-day -day job, it, it doesn't really affect things simply because most of the research and work I do is in, in maths where, I suppose, moral uh, compunctions aren't really an issue. Now you've written an essay um, on Mises.org. It's called A Society of Criminals. And uh, you basically argue that everyone in society implicitly sort of 
sanctions criminal behavior. But Everyone but us. <laughs> We're the good ones. <laughs> yeah, except for us. So yeah. uh, can you just talk a bit more about that? Um, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I guess uh, the essay, that's one I suppose I was uh, that, that got a bit of a response from people on the internet. The, the essay talks about the fact that uh, really there's less separation between uh, what people think of as common criminals, the kind of people that break into your house and uh, steal your television set, and the ordinary so-called law-abiding members of society who, you know, pay their taxes and uh, don't break into other people's houses, but nevertheless have uh, an attitude of often entitlement uh, or at least acquiescence with with the idea that they're entitled to other people's property as long as they get it through the political system. And so uh, I guess that essay is just really about looking at the simil similarities between uh, the, the so-called common criminals, which I mentioned are actually really the most uncommon kind, and uh, the rest of the population who um, indirectly engage in, in this kind of criminal conduct of, of taking property that doesn't belong to them um, and, and is engaging in other kinds of forms of coercion through the political system. Yeah, it's amazing how when the government does something, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, that's really uh, something that's so ingrained in people's mentalities is that, uh, I mean, when I wrote that particular article you're talking about, um, the impetus for the article was that a uh, friend of mine uh, had just uh, bought a house fairly recently and there'd been a spate of robberies in her area and um, I think some people had made off with uh, television sets and things like this, just walked them out the front door. And she was just horrified with this and uh, came around and was very angry, and I think rightfully so, and saying things like, you know, how dare these people and what makes them think they have the right to do this. And it just kind of struck me that that is people's attitude when they see explicit acts of criminality like that, and yet you take the exact same thing done through the apparatus of the state um, with, you know, an equal amount or greater amount of coercion being applied, but just done through that sanctioning of having gone through the political system and people's attitude is just totally different. Yeah, I mean, for me, the moral arguments are probably the strongest. Um, I mean, I used to be utilitarian. I used to be a Friedmanite. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, you make this point in your essay as well. You say it towards the end, I think, you say um, that, you know, people should not be afraid to point out these moral issues and this in, in terms of strategy, it might actually be better to be very radical and use strong language and not be afraid of being reasonable or being seeming unreasonable. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I, I think libertarians do themselves sometimes a little bit of a disservice in the way they frame their arguments by not being, um, I guess, maybe radical enough is the word for it. I, I think just clear enough. I think fundamentally all we're asking is that people shouldn't commit crimes and we're making the case that a lot of the things done through the political system are crimes even though people don't recognize them as such and that if you accept that view then all we're really asking is that people refrain from committing crimes and I think when you state the philosophy in that simple way I think it has a lot of power but when you start diluting it by talking about public policy this and uh, even even free market versus socialism, I think that takes it away at a level, a further level of abstraction that takes it away from just that simple argument that all we're really saying is don't steal from people, don't kill people, don't bash people up, etc. And uh, I think stated in that simplest form, it's at its most powerful. And so this is part of uh, what you're going to be talking about in the speech, the seminar? Yeah. Um, well, look, what I'm planning to talk about in the uh, in the seminar is about the theory of natural law, uh, which is the idea that there is an objective set of moral principles that we might call law um, that are just really determined by the nature of man and therefore arise naturally. And I'm going to have a look at this argument and some of the um, arguments for and against this and just talk about what it would mean if we accept natural law to be true and uh, and its content to be uh, as libertarians have argued it to be. But do you see uh, some some role for utilitarian arguments or do you feel like you know these natural law arguments should be given utmost priority? 
Well, I think there's a kind of a symbiosis between them. I mean, arguably, you could even say that the justification for the natural law arguments is a kind of inductive empirical observation and that, I don't know, I, I'm not quite sure whether I would agree with this, but you could argue in favour of the existence of natural law on a utilitarian base. Did, wasn't Mises a utilitarian? Or? Yeah, I think he was, and, and Rand and Rothbard were not. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, the argument for natural law, at least the one I find the most compelling, is just the the kinds of arguments in moral philosophy that tell you that there is an objective theory of moral philosophy determined by the nature of man. That if you accept that that's true, if you accept that the nature of man necessitates certain moral statements to be objectively true or false, then really it stands to reason that there would be also objective moral principles pertaining to the use of force and um, the things that political philosophy looks at. And really, as soon as you've accepted that, you've accepted natural law. You've accepted that there are objective moral principles of political philosophy. So, yeah, I mean, just to go back to the point of strategy, um, mm. you know, there's a lot of uh, like libertarian think tanks these days, and it seems like universities, we, I mean, probably haven't succeeded as much. Do you think? I mean, you see this, you see change coming from within. Like universities or from outside organizations, like you know, Mises Institute or something like that. Well, I think long term, the universities are probably the most powerful institution in society, um, simply because they are the filter through which every other intellectual and academic field um, goes. Um, so I think long term, if libertarians want to. Um, conquer society, conquer is probably the wrong word when you're advocating non-coercion, but you know what I mean, yeah. that if they want to uh, have their system implemented in society, I think long term their goal has to be to um, have a serious presence in the universities and, and ideally um, become as dominant in the universities as the left are today. Yeah, um, so one of the um, things that I'm really missing in this country is the fact that there are so few libertarian scholars and academics, I mean, in terms of like Austrian school, especially. And yeah, I think, like, I think that's true. Here, they don't do um, historical revisionism or, you know, looking at the Great Depression here or looking at the gold standard and looking at all those things that they look at over there in America. Seems to be a lot less focus on, you know, you know, sort of having libertarian interpretations of academic things that are inter of interest to academics. Yeah, um, there, there definitely are only a small number of, I suppose, proper libertarian scholars over in Australia. I think in order to really be doing the kind of volume of work that occurs over in America, you need a much bigger mass of people. Obviously, there are a lot more people, just academics in general in the US. And so, yeah. But also, I think there is a, a, a pretty huge scholarly body of libertarian academics over in America. It's quite... Uh, it's quite tiny here, here by comparison. Yeah. So, is there any um, sort of particular issue you think that um, I don't know, like you can work with the the left on? Like, I mean, I know there's anti-war stuff. Like, Sh sure. Um, I mean, I guess I think you can work with non-libertarians in general, whether they be left or right, on individual issues where you agree. Um, I don't really see any problem with that as long as you don't subordinate your philosophy to the to the smaller goal of working on a project with someone. So, for example, you know, if if you were wanting to, um, I, I guess, work with a, a leftist on some kind of uh, war-related revisionism or something like that, I, I really I don't see any any impediment to that. Um, but obviously, the danger when you're working in that way is is trying to make sure that you're not subordinating the ultimate goal to the kind of exigencies of of the moment. So what have you? What are you um, working on at the moment besides this natural law piece? Is there anything of interest? Um, uh, well, I mean, obviously there's mathematical work, which is probably not the interest of your audience. Yeah, I saw today. an article you had in the Court yeah. of Austrian Economics. Um, that was a critique of the st strict preference approach. Ooh. Yeah, yep. yeah. That seems a very, very technical topic. I'm not really sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, it's a technical topic within um, Austrian economics just to do with, um, I suppose, whether 
whether preferences, strict preferences can be um, induced from the fact of action. Um, look, yes, yeah, it's, it's a technical topic, yeah, and yeah. so probably best for anyone who's interested to read the article. Um, as far as other things I'm doing, one of my kind of main interests in um, – there's a bit of a crossover between libertarianism and statistics – is looking at the phenomenon of discrimination and, uh, you know, things like sex discrimination, race discrimination and things like that. And I've written quite a few articles on this and it's kind of a, a topic of ongoing research for me, looking at just the logical dynamics of when does it make logical sense to discriminate on the basis of characteristics like sex and race and age and all of these demographic criteria. And when does it make logical sense, in your view? Um, well, look, basically... It may, in any kind of discrimination problem, what you're usually interested in doing is trying to make inferences about some unknown characteristic of a person. And so race discrimination and sex discrimination and all of those things make sense in any case where the unknown characteristic of interest to you is correlated with race and sex and those other things conditional on whatever information you have. So that, that's kind of an abstract statement for it, but I can give you an example if you, if, if you like. Yeah. Um, well, this is an example I use uh, sometimes in, in some of my writings on discrimination, um, that in the 1980s uh, there was a study done by a civil rights uh, group who found that taxi drivers, basically taxi drivers were less likely to pick up a passenger in Washington, D.C. if he was a young black male. Um, so they did an empirical study of this and, uh, and came to the conclusion that if you were a young black male, you were less likely to be picked up uh, as a passenger than, say, an old white woman or something else. And there was a bit of an outcry over this of whether, you know, that was fair. Obviously, um, there was a strong case that that was racial discrimination. And I think that's an example of where race and sex discrimination do make sense in that context because what what the study well and, and other studies were finding was that the taxi drivers doing this uh, whether they were white or black or whatever themselves were aware of the fact that various demographic groups had higher crime rates than others and when they wanted to pick up a passenger in their cab they obviously wanted to avoid assault and robbery and things like that so they would t steer clear of high-risk groups, all, all other things being equal. So they would steer clear of men over women, uh, particularly young men and particularly young black men, who they uh, knew to have higher crime rates. And that's a kind of an example where if you're the taxi driver, I guess, you have to make this decision about whether to pick up a, a, a passenger on the basis of a very, very small amount of information. All you really know about the person is what they look like in the kind of two to ten seconds before you make a decision to either keep driving or pick them up. And so really in that time, all you know is their race, age approximately, their sex, what they're wearing, their demeanour for the very short of short amount of time that you observe them. And and so in that instance, any any kind of information you're getting in that small set of information that is related, even just statistically, empirically related to, say, the commission of crime, that's a logically valid basis then to use to try to guess whether you're going to be assaulted or not. And so that's that's uh, something economists call rational discrimination. It's funny that the people who are most against discrimination are also in favor of minimum wage laws. <laughs> and uh, I think studies have shown that minimum wage laws have been used against the poor blacks, uh, especially in America. And, you know, it allows employers to discriminate on the basis of factors other than skill and uh, because of the set yeah. Set wage rates. Yeah. yeah, well, I think a lot of people are unaware of the kind of consequences of minimum wage laws is that it, it creates a really a hurdle um, for low productivity people. And that tends to be um, poor young people who have very small amounts of skills. So it does, yeah, it really does adversely ex uh, affect um, poor people, racial minorities, young people, people like that. In terms of economics, it's great to see that these days a lot more people know about the Austrian theory of the business cycle, uh, and you know even people like John Quiggin in Australia and you know uh, some other economists they've been forced to sort of address it. 
and respond to these these arguments? Yeah, well, massive economic breakdown will do that, won't it? It's, <laughs> it's a shame that it took what it's what's happening now for that to happen. But I think, you know, I think the mainstream kind of economics profession and the Keynesians in particular, and some of the neoclassicals, and, and I think their explanation of what's going on has been very poor, and their predictions of what would happen over the years have, have both been very poor. And, and the fact is that Austrian economists, by and large, have been very good at predicting what was going to happen with our economy, and, and they have a very plausible explanation for us. So I, I think people are starting to listen. Do you know much about uh, people like uh, Rubini? And, you know, they, there's, he's claimed to have predicted this as well. What, what are, do you know much about his views? Is he a Keynesian? Or? I, I have no idea, I'm afraid. I, I don't think I've ever even heard of Rubini. Um, yeah. I, I should just say, look, the business cycle and that kind of macroeconomic stuff is really not my specialty. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I know what a kind of a lay person who dabbles in this stuff knows. Yeah. Well, um, I'm thinking that we'll wrap things up for now, um, unless you have anything else to add. Uh, no, just uh, thanks very much for uh, talking to me and uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to organise this conference and uh, I'm looking forward to speaking there and I hope uh, people will come along and enjoy themselves. Yeah, one of the things that I'm hoping the conference will do is you know, bring like-minded people together and then they'll actually start to strategize and work together and sort of build a bit of a movement here. So yeah, and it would be nice to just put some faces to the names. I've talked to a few people over the phone um, that I've never met in person, you for example, and uh, various others. And I think it would just be nice to get together and uh, be able to chat face to face with people. All right. So just for everyone listening, the website is mises.org.au, and you can buy tickets. It's one hundred sixty-five dollars for both the dinner and the day seminar. And there's a huge list of speakers there. We've got Chris Le Leithner. Uh, he's written a great book, Attacking the RBA. Um, we've got Stephen Cates from RMIT University. He's speaking about the differences between classical economics and Austrian economics. Um, we've got another guy, uh, from another lecturer from Macquarie University, Andrew Dadal. Um, he's speaking about how fiat paper money is unconstitutional under the Australian Constitution. Um, and a whole bunch of other great speakers. So just check out the website. And, of course, we've got Ben O'Neill. So thanks for speaking with me, Ben O'Neill. And I'll hopefully speak to you again soon. Thank you.